This is Jay, and for the very first subculture vulture, we will be picking at baseball. Now, when I say the word baseball, I'm sure a lot of you are just thinking, boring. But for many fans like myself, baseball is still America's pastime, as American as apple pie, French fries, and Canadian bacon. Wait, no. Um, well, its history is riddled with unproven lore, made-up stories, and racial tensions, at times representing the best and worst of... Baseball has its origins in several other ball-and-stick-based games, some of them preceding the more modern game by hundreds of years, town ball, rounders, and cricket being the most commonly known. Those games likely derive from children's ball games that date back to before medieval times, so who cares? We're probably pushing it with baseball being the first topic as it is. The first known written reference, a Princeton student diary entry from 1786, was written as based ball. That's with a T. The second can be found in a 1791 Pittsfield, Massachusetts ordinance, barring baseball from being played within 80 yards of the town's meeting hall, citing its fragile glass windows. In many ways, this early game barely resembles the game we know today. And without getting into the minutia of all ye old timey rules, here are some of the more interesting differences. First, the iconic balls and strikes didn't exist until 1887, just pitched till they hit it with the object of the game more focused on the skill of the defense as opposed to the skill of the pitcher in our modern version. There was even a period where the batter could literally choose a high or low pitch. Second, early pitchers were also all underhanded, referring to the position of the pitcher's arm when throwing and not a personal condemnation in any way. In addition, fielders could catch the ball on one bounce to get a batter out or get a base runner out by hitting them with a thrown ball, like when you played kickball at summer camp. A ground rule double, where the ball bounces over the home run fence and becomes unplayable for the fielder, was a home run as recently as the 1930s. In fact, it is rumored that one of Hall of Famer Lou Gehrig's home runs from the lauded 1927 Murderer's Row New York Yankees was in fact a ground rule double by today's ruling. For many years, it was the legend that Abner Doubleday, a Civil War soldier, invented the distinguished game of baseball. This turned out to be a fabricated story created in 1908, possibly to simplify a complicated narrative or maybe to endear the fans to a sport by attaching it to American historical figures. Such was the role of the Mills Commission, a team tasked with promoting baseball in the early 20th century. This point was clarified, or more correctly rectified, in 1939, when the Baseball Hall of Fame sought to sort out the true history and this story was proven to be false. There really isn't any historical evidence at all that Doubleday knew of a game called baseball, let alone any implying he was its creator. While Abner Doubleday's involvement was pure myth, a guy by the name of Alexander Cartwright is accurately credited with standardizing early rules while also creating the New York Knickerbockers baseball club. Many of the early organized teams were put together the way we put together modern day 40 and over softball teams by occupation. This included teams of skilled tradesmen, bankers, teachers, doctors, sailors, and even undertakers. No, not, not those undertakers. Cartwright and his Knickerbockers are believed to have played the first known competitive game on June 19, 1846 at the Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey. At least something interesting happened in New Jersey. As more teams were formed, the first organization of competitive clubs was created as a collection of 16 New York area teams, thus forming the NABBP, or the National Association of Baseball Players. This league and the resulting champions were also the first known baseball championship. Now, have you picked up on it, this league had two B's representing both base and ball in the acronym. An example of how the word baseball itself evolved over the years from two words, then hyphenation, leading eventually to the single word we know today. In 1869, the taboo of paying baseball players met its reckoning. Keeping the players as unpaid amateurs had been keeping the game pure, and I'm sure player compensation cutting into ticket and concession sales profit had nothing to do with it. Nevertheless, an opportunity was seized, and the Cincinnati Red Stockings became the first professional baseball team by quite literally getting the best players money could buy. The team went on an undefeated streak from its 1869 inception through to mid-1870, reaching 71 games. The team's first loss, the first extra innings thriller in history, led to declining attendance and their eventual breakup. 
Key members then took their talents to the northeast of the country. They were renamed the Boston Red Stockings, an early version of the current Atlanta Braves, while also bringing an early Red Sox name to Boston. Clear through to the 1900s, there are a few widely recognizable names aside from Cy Young. Though some players of note are Old Hoss Radborn, setting the untouchable single-season pitching record of 60 wins, while also being credited as the first person captured flipping the bird in a photograph. Another one of note, Candy Cummings, who is not an adult film star, is widely credited as the inventor of the curveball. As you can see, the names back then were pretty priceless. Sure, there were cool nicknames like King Kelly and Cap Anson, but the real jackpots of the nickname lottery are Buttercup Dickerson and Cannonball Titcomb. There's Chicken Wolf, whose real name is William Van Winkle Wolf. So... Guess he was thinking, I don't, I don't know what he was thinking. And the unremarkable careers, but quite remarkable nicknames of, uh, and, okay, that got out of hand quickly. How did we get from Buttercup to, moving on. With pitchers learning these new deceptive pitches and simply throwing harder, in unison with repeatedly used, dirty, warped baseballs that weren't replaced for most, if not all, of a game, the threat was growing ever greater of a player getting severely injured if struck by a pitch. As a result, the end of what was known as the dead ball era arrived in somewhat of a literal fashion when Cleveland shortstop Ray Chapman was hit in the head with a pitch he probably never even saw. After being taken to the hospital and later succumbing to his injuries, the league changed the rules and in that same season, 1920, the league mandated the use and regular replacement of game balls. So began what we refer to as the live ball era which lasts up to and including today's iteration. Around the same time, a young pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, Babe Ruth, aided by the newer visible baseballs, was beginning to show greater prowess at the plate. In 1919, he set the single season record with 29 home runs, which ironically led to his contract being sold to the Yankees after that very season. It is rumored the Red Sox owner did this to fund the production of a musical, but that just seems to be mostly speculation about his financial situation at the time. Regardless of motivation, the curse of the Bambino and the decades-long dominance of the Yankees are proof this decision resonated throughout baseball history thereafter. I really can't understate how great a pitcher he was during his early career, holding the record for consecutive scoreless innings in the World Series for 43 years. Still, it was his hitting that was becoming infamous. His novel approach to swinging, for power as opposed to contact, led to Babe Ruth breaking his own record with a whopping 54 dingers the very next year, another 59 in 1921, and topping out with 60 in 1927, the famous murderer's row lineup. That 1920 total of 54, his first season as a Yankee, was more than 14 of the other 15 teams in the league at the time. Seeing what an icon the Babe had become as a result of this power surge led to many players adopting this more aggressive swinging style. The power hitter revolution had arrived. Through the next several decades, the game slowly became more and more recognizable as the game we know and love today. Expansion teams were added, and teams with deep-rooted history moved across the country. New rules were adopted, and popularity grew steadily from Babe Ruth's time through to the Korean War, partially aided by growing alongside the popularity of television. This was America's pastime. But it wasn't until April 15, 1947, with Jackie Robinson making his debut for the Brooklyn Dodgers, when we truly started to see the best players compete against one another. For years, players like Cool Papa Bell, Josh Gibson, and Satchel Paige made heads turn in their own right as stars in the Negro Leagues. It is on their shoulders, in addition to the aforementioned Jackie Robinson in the NL and Larry Doby in the AL, both making their first appearances in 1947, by which all current MLB players stand on. As a fan personally, not having the matchups of a prime Satchel Paige or Josh Gibson versus their National and American League contemporaries temporaries will always feel like a missed opportunity we will never get back. At the very least, the MLB in 2020 finally acknowledged that Negro League statistics are MLB statistics. It probably should have happened sooner. It's inarguable to me that the numbers from a comparable parallel league to modern baseball are at least as relevant and valuable as those that date back to when the car, telephone, and light bulbs were in their infancy or not even in Invented yet. Sorry, Jack Glasscock. In addition to racial boundary issues, there are a lot of lowlights throughout the history of baseball. 
For starters, you have the recent steroid era. Then you can go all the way back to the Black Sox scandal of 1919, made famous by the movie Eight Men Out. Add those to the lifetime banning of Pete Rose for gambling as a player and manager and sprinkle in several work stoppages in the form of strikes and lockouts, and you got yourself one fine fuster cluck. One of the worst, however, second only to the integration resistance, is the reserve clause. These stand out not so much as black eyes on the sport, but two broken orbital bones on its face. Established in the early days of professional baseball and stemming from owners' reluctance to pay the players from the very beginning, the reserve clause effectively forever linked the best players to their first team. This meant, from a professional standpoint, you were the property of the team and at their mercy in almost all respects, especially salary negotiations. You were signed or later drafted. You never had a competitive pay market when contracts ended, regardless of skill level, and were subject to trades without any consent or negotiation leverage. This was a serious issue that met a boiling point when Kurt Flood, a star for the St. Louis Cardinals, was unceremoniously traded to my local Philadelphia Phillies and responded by refusing to play for his new team, citing the ludicrous nature of the reserve clause. It went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1972 with Flood v. Kuhn, eventually resulting in the abolishment of the Reserve Clause. By the next collective bargaining agreement in 1976, the contract between owners and the Players Union, free agency was defined by a performance-based class system, making significant changes in 2012 revolving more around service time as opposed to performance, leading to the current collective bargaining agreement... Um, from its pre-Civil War origins on rural farmlands to its quick growth in larger cities to the stars who served in the armed forces during the wars of the 20th century and its transcendent larger-than-life celebrities, it's impossible not to think about baseball when talking about American history. Underdogs overcoming the odds, stories of redemption, lessons in equality, and kings of the mountain. There are a lot of great narratives in there. I, myself, a former open mic comedian, wrote one of my first and most well-written jokes about how baseball has changed the way we talk. If you hesitate when an opportunity presents itself, you are said to have balked at it. Many companies employ a three strikes and you're out policy, and both pitchers and life can throw you nasty curveballs at times. So concludes the very first subculture vulture. I appreciate if you were able to sit through this. Uh, this episode essentially serves as more of a work in progress and proof of concept of everything else. My, my editing skills certainly uh, leave a lot to be desired. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I cut a lot of my breaths out and a lot of the video to try to keep up with, with the topic of conversation in the moment. So I don't know if that was distracting or anything. Please comment below with any advice or criticisms. I will take to them kindly, at least early on. Later on, I, I, I may not be so willing to admit that I, I'm not a genius. But please uh, like, subscribe if this is something you might be interested in. Probably going to look to do wrestling or true crime. If you have an opinion on that, please also leave that in the comments. My name is Jay. This was Subculture Vulture, and thanks for your attention.